Uh oh, right. no, I don't have that. <laughs> Good evening and welcome to the February 7th, uh, 2022. Do it again. Okay. Good evening and welcome to the February 7th, 2022, regularly scheduled school committee meeting. Time is now 6 p.m. and we'll call this meeting to order. Um, as a reminder, if anyone is audio or videotaping, please let us know by raising your hand if you're in the virtual audience. Okay, you look like anybody is. So at this time we'll rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right, we'll have our roll call. Kathy, do you mind starting us off? Gregory Thompson. Gordon Smith, Superintendent of Schools. Sarah Trulio. Bill Fonseca. Elizabeth Marcin Boucher. Nick Cassidy. Excellent. Thank you. So we have some um, minutes for approval. Move to approve the January 18th, 2022 regular session meeting minutes. Motion made by Bill. I'll second. Second by Beth. Any further discussion? Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. And that motion carries five to zero. One more set. The January 18, 2022 executive session meeting. Motion made by Ansonella. Second. Second by Greg. Any further discussion? Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. And that motion carries five to zero. Thank you very much. And thank you, Kathy, for capturing those. Um, we have an opportunity for visitors to address the committee now. There isn't anybody in attendance here, but if you're watching, I see Mr. McCarthy has his hand up. Good evening. Good evening, how are you? Sure, that's you. Oh, sorry. I'm muted. Your volume? My volume, maybe? Hold on. Sorry, uh, Justin. That better? Yeah, I tried. Okay. All right. Good evening. Sorry about that. No problem. Uh, Go so ahead. Three yep, and you're all set. Thank you. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, last month, you guys had the curriculum director show up and uh, she told you that um, at the recommendation of elementary specialists that the, the safe schools program was gonna be added to the curriculum. I would imagine that's elementary curriculum since the elementary specialists are the ones who recommended it. So there's no discussion about what this program entails. So I went to DESE's website and it says, quote, that the program provides training and technical assistance relating to LGBTQ students and staff to facilitate an understanding of sexual orientation and gender identity. It goes on to say that the Safe Schools Program is proud to offer newly created curricula materials to help provide LGBTQ inclusive lessons. These resources range from hour long discussions to multi-day lessons. And it's available quote, in public schools across the state, including public preschools. So um, I have a daughter in elementary school. I have another young daughter who's going to be entering elementary school. And I just don't think that this needs to be part of their curriculum. Um, back in November, you guys discussed uh, in a, a social emotional learning survey from teachers kindergarten to two. And the survey showed a significant across the board decline in the, the social and emotional development of our kids. And the past two years with uh, the lockdowns and the closures and the masks, I believe irreparable mental harm has been done to, to our kids and developmental harm. So I don't think we need to pile on top of it with, with this sort of stuff. So I'm asking simply that there's some discussion 
about this program? Um, first of all, why do we need it? Can we get these elementary specialists to tell us why we need training on sexual orientation and gender identity in elementary schools? And what, what is the extent of this? Are we talking about a book or two in the library or are we talking about hour long lessons or multi-day lessons? Um, there's a lot of people here in town that you guys represent who, who would like to know more details about this and about the extent of this program. So uh, thank you very much for your time and thank you for your, your service on the committee. Thank you. All right, so I think it's always good to be able to hear from individuals in the community. Um, Heather Brown is not with us this evening, but that is certainly something that we can work to provide some additional information on relative to DESE's initiative around the Safe Schools program. And we can add that to an upcoming agenda in order to provide some clarification for the community at large. But Absolutely. thank you for sharing that sentiment, um, Mr. McCarthy. Mm -hmm. Is there anyone else in the audience who is looking to address the committee this evening? Okay, with that, we'll move forward with um, committee and subcommittee reports. Uh, Greg, you want to start us tonight? Uh, nothing this evening. Thank okay, you. thank you. It's not. No, nothing. No. All right. Well, I just left the uh, ladies' uh, freshman basketball game, and it was very, very close one. It was tied 18-18, um, literally with like a minute left, and they they didn't prevail against Minnetonka. They lost 21 to 18, but it was a great game, and the spectators were doing a wonderful job of um, students and families alike of respecting the, the, masks, the masking and we're just really great um, participation on the sidelines as well as the ladies gave a, a great performance. So best of luck to them as they finish their season. Good. Bill? Yep. Uh, LPBC Career Tech Students of the Month, Culinary, Culinary Arts, Asia Schaefer, Early Education and Care One, Savannah Bissonette, Information Support and Services and Networking One, Hayden Fry. And Information Support and Services Networking Two, Matthew Pelletier. Congratulations to all those students on their hard work. So thank you both for sharing that. And I'm good, thank you. Nick? Yes, I have a couple of things to share. Thank you. Um, since I, haven't, I wasn't here last time. Um, at ELHS on the 24th, we entered a new semester and started our new classes. So over the past few weeks, we've kind of just been um, kind of getting into these new classes, understanding like what they offer um, uh, and our new teachers. Um, last week, the freshmen took the um, bi biology MCAS. I have a couple of freshmen friends and they're all talking about like, oh, we just had MCAS, blah, blah, blah. But I mean, this is something to talk about. Um, and one exciting thing that's actually happening at ELHS is Spartanum. Um, and uh, during Spartana, I mean, um, I've like had time to like watch them and um, like hear them. And the show dates are March 12th and 11th at 7 p.m. for those interested. And it is in person, person as of right now. Um, so that will be really exciting. I know a lot of kids are happy to have it be in person because I was in it my sophomore year and then it got canceled. So I'm really happy to see it be in person. And um, most winter sports are kind of coming to an end now, but most kids are excited for the spring and all those sports outside. Very good. Thank you, Nick. Thanks for sharing. All right, so pass it over to so Gordon, who's going to give us a, an update on sure. our me, uh, progress with the testing stay. Up here on the screen. Okay, uh, so as I think most everyone knows, as uh, certainly all of you know, uh, we are participating in the um, DESE Test and Stay program. Uh, and we've been going through their onboarding uh, the last few weeks. And so what that means is we've been working with a CIC health program coordinator, um, Christine McWilliams, and uh, she has been helping us order supplies. She has been helping organize uh, right now up to three other employees from CIC 
who could be on site to help run the actual testing. And um, she has helped us get up and running with getting the consent set up. And as of at least this afternoon, last week it was 400, but as of this afternoon, we had 415 people consenting. Um, we have the test kits and the supplies to get running. Um, our hope is that later this week, we will uh, meet with the staff that will be on site. We'll be able to give them tours and possibly be up and running by the end of the week. Um, just to give you a little bit of a background, because I know that uh, this has been confusing. So DESE offers four testing options, testing programs, if you will. We currently are participating in the test and stay. And what that means is that if someone has been identified as a close contact due to being um, within that distance of less than three feet for over 15 minutes accumulated time on a given day to someone who is positive, and all this has happened in, a, in school or a school-sponsored event, those individuals, as long as they're asymptomatic and consent to be part of the program, can, during the morning, come in, test with a rapid antigen test. As long as the test is negative, they can go on um, to their classes. Uh, that would happen during the regular quarantine time, so roughly five times, uh, five mornings, as long as they stay asymptomatic. <clears throat> Pooled testing symptomatic testing, and then the one that um, was just recently, and it'll be on the next slide, uh, introduced home testing. Right now, those are other options that DESE offers, but we're not participating in. Um, in I'm going to move to the next slide unless there are questions. Are you all good so far? Well, the one thing uh, um, also worth mentioning is, is for the unvaccinated are the only ones who qualify for test and stay, is that correct? Um, if you're vaccinated, you can't be a direct contact. You're not a, a close contact. Um, yes, you're correct. You're not a close contact as long as you're asymptomatic. Right, but the only people that are eligible for testing stay are the unvaccinated. Yeah, if they're state. identified as a close contact. That's the only way to be eligible for testing stay. Correct. Isn't it? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Wasn't meant to be a trick question. No, <laughs> I had to think about it I mean, because it's. Like anything else, if you, it's it's there's a lot of different variables. Well, I, well, I specifically had a parent ask me based on the uh, form to sign up for. You know, right. my students are vaccinated. Should I sign up? And my response was no because they wouldn't qualify as of yet. If we opt Correct. into some other program, they would not be identified as a close contact. Right. So they unless, opt in. and and only would they be in a, a tough situation as if when they became symptomatic. Which they wouldn't be eligible for testing stay anyway. Right. Once you become symptomatic. So I think yeah. that four hundred within that four hundred and twenty-five, mm -hmm. they're probably some of them are probably vaccinated. They just don't understand it. Probably. I can't imagine we have four hundred twenty-five unvaccinated. Unvaccinated. Students. Well, we're yeah, we're still close. Probably close, but they're we're still the hovering right around sixty-nine percent at the high school in terms still? of students. Yeah, vaccinated. Um, we're mm -hmm. increasing now in the younger grades okay. due to the fact that. The new vaccination is out, and is it just because we're not asking the right question, or I feel like we should be there by now? The town is almost eighty percent, aren't they? No, no. The town, no, no, yeah, town's still in the. the I believe the either. 60s, I believe. 60s, yeah. yeah, yeah, but I thought the schools would be considerably better, and the high school specifically. But do they consider oh. kids fully vaccinated if they have not had the booster? Right now, if they've had both shots, Pfizer or Moderna, yeah, or. The Johnson See, and Johnson. I don't want to cast aspersions on this, but in my mind, the vaccines have been out there for over a year now. If you're going to get vaccinated, I assume you would have done it by now. Well, sure. well and I mean, it gives me a chance to plug our vaccine. Yeah, what's going, going on? on. Yeah. We want mask optional. We have fifty eight percent. Oh, I know. I, I don't think Jesse's going to take it off in the next month or two. I don't think they are. So we have to because the town will. I bet at the end of this month, the town will take it off. So well, if we can get to trending 80, in the right way, the right area. Yeah. If we can get to eighty percent of the high school, we can go mask optional for the rest of the school year well, potentially. Just, prom, but I'm just no, no. I agree. Yeah. So I, just, you know, I mean, we got to figure out a way to get more information because I feel we're closer than 69 percent. I don't so, know how, or maybe just the clinics will help. Maybe you push the clinics and say, listen, if your peers can get in and get vaccinated, those that haven't that are on the fence, that might tip the scales to, to go mask optional at the high school. 
Yeah, yeah could. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So we've shared we've shared information on the clinic um, over the last few weeks with yeah. all families. Yeah. yeah. It'll be interesting to see what the attendance was at the clinic when you know when it all flushes out. Is that next week? It's today. It's today. Oh, it's today. Yeah. And then there's it's another the another one on the twenty eighth. Okay. So um, along those lines, I'll let Mr. Mackey get back on, onto the screen. No, it's okay. It, it is confusing um, while we're waiting to get to this screen uh, because you bring up the consent form I, and I know it's confusing, especially online. You bring up the consent form and the first thing that it goes to is pooled testing. And so I wanted to make sure that uh, it's very clear that right now all we're participating in is the test and stay program. Unfortunately, East Long Meadow and no other school district can change the consent form. That's part of the testing program. If we're opting in, that's the consent form. Um, so I just wanna make sure families know all they are consenting to right now is test and stay and to the point that Mr. Thompson's making, really it's a limited um, population that would be if, um, they are within that three feet and possibly could be identified. If they're vaccinated, then they're not going to be a close contact. So you're right. So it becomes a smaller, a smaller population. However, in our elementary schools and our middle school, it's larger than in the high school. High school has always had the, the smallest amount of um, identified close contact due to that fact. Right. Well, it's an option to opt out of the quarantine. It's the only way opting out of quarantine. If you're vaccinated, you're not a close contact, but this would be the other option for right. families to choose this. Correct. For in person or for as, um, as long as exposure, yeah, yeah. as long as they're identified <laughs> which silly, well, in my opinion. Through our programs. Yeah. So that's that's a I guess a good segue because it's this point of confusion. Um, so on January 18th, as we were still doing our onboarding to test and stay. DESE, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, introduced a new part of their program, testing program, and this is home testing. So this is where they are providing districts who opt in um, rapid antigen tests weekly, I believe. No, every other week, every other week, so that the districts then can distribute them to families who opt into this program. And it's a whole nother opt-in process. The key for the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education for a district to move into this is that they have to be doing one of the two other programs, pool testing or symptomatic testing in order to move into home testing. But it definitely has been the push since January 18 that that's where DESE would like to go. And it's for a couple of reasons, I think it's, um, the biggest reason is probably because they would like to see or take the burden off school nurses around the whole close contact tracing. So does test and stay and symptomatic testing then go away if you get into home testing? Symptomatic testing still could happen because you could have people who present symptoms during the day and they come down to the health room and um, they, if they've consented, they can get a rapid antigen test to see whether they have COVID, don't have COVID, can continue on their, with their work or with their school day. Test and stay would go away. Test and stay would go away. See, that was the part of originally why we didn't want to get into systematic because we didn't want to overwhelm our mm -hmm. internal system. But by taking that portion away and doing the home testing, that frees up that whole test and stay program goes away. You still would have the CIC helping you. Um, you're for still the symptomatic for symptomatic possibly and um, for organizing this program the, the at home test yeah most likely to be your CIC program coordinator it probably would not keep too many of the sort of on-site personnel so should we should we get into the symptomatic testing program that's up to you I mean we have yet to really and broach test and the whole, stay the home testing program yeah I mean how how quickly does it happen so this class? this has taken us what three four weeks to get on board and really be ready to up yeah. um, actually do the program. Districts around us who um, were doing test and stay and doing symptomatic testing who are opting in have just begun this program. The home, one. the home one, yep. um, and they were trying to figure out their struggle is how do I distribute this? Does it go home 
the you know the rapid antigen test go home with the child at the elementary level in the backpack? Um, what what is the um, how do I communicate this? How do I deal with the opt-in? Because there is a basically it's a Google form that Desi has created and said, okay, use this, but you still have to create a system similar to say the consent, the electronic consent, possibly to have it um, somewhat easier for families to opt in. Would everyone be eligible for the at home? Test? As far as I understand it, everybody who's interested in unvaccinated. They all, can, they, all school, can opt, yep. they all can opt out They all can opt Symptomatic, in. asymptomatic. Yeah, I don't think that matters. Oh. Okay, so why don't we do that? But would the family, and I, this is a yeah, just sure. clarification, would a family have to opt into symptomatic in order to also be able to opt in to at home? No, they'd have to opt into the, uh, to the at home. Yeah, I think they opt in. So when they sign the- I think the, we go for the whole thing all at once. We add symptomatic and then we, at the same time, we'll get rid of test and stay and start the at home. Right. It's going to all happen at once. So we don't have to opt in to the symptomatic and home one. Right, Gordon? Yeah, yes. So the, the we, district, the district uh, basically is the the group electing with a vote by all of you to move into symptomatic testing, which would then allow the district once you have voted, I can then do a what they call a survey mm -hmm. for DESI to say we also and you can add that to your motion if you like um, to complete the survey to move into the home testing program. But that would families to the question yeah. I think you're asking, we could still have our nursing staff if it's a child who is coming down with symptoms to the, the nurse's office call and say, I have your child here. Um, you have consented, you know, that they can check that or you have not consented, would you like me to do a rapid oh. antigen test? So we can opt in day of. That's you can opt in day No, I get that. But I also just think like for families, like we're talking about something that was already a little bit confusing. I know we're going to have to confuse them again. Like, this a is lot of that's what I mean. Like, yeah. So then for them Just to now it. opt into something else is what it is. And we're basically invalidating what they've already consented to. You're, you're, you're not invalidating it because well, we're not, we wouldn't participate. We're still going to use it for a month. It's going to take a month. Yeah, it's going to take time to get up. and run. That's why we should do it now. We wait a month and then yeah. we're another month. Back. So, so we're really not closing out the test and stay program. No. Until we have the ability to run. Oh, home. yeah, no, right. But I think once we start the at home, it would cease. The you would, you would start to yeah, move yeah. off of it. Yes. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. No, it does. It does. I just I want to make sure like we are. No, I think it's clear important. for families. Yeah, it's that's very confusing. I well, think. and even if we opt in the so systematic, your question as well, we can we have to ask permission for that right. too. That's but what I'm saying. we can do yes. that day of, which is really what's that's the only one that symptomatic really makes sense for is day of because right. Oh, you have symptoms. Let's get consent from your yeah. fam family, or we'll send you. Home. Yeah. Right. If if we were identifying the, to take it off the symptomatic, let's say we had a positive. It was. We're doing the close contact tracing pretty rapidly, and all of a sudden, Gordon Smith has been identified as a close contact. If I them and brought down to the nurse's office, and they call my parents um, at that point, if I am asymptomatic and my parents have not consented for me to participate test and stay, mm -hmm. they could at that time yeah. um, authorize for me to do test and stay, and then as long as they test positive or should mean negative, negative. <laughs> I go on my way. But I think families should just also be aware that they didn't consent to this like right now right. because it's right. very confusing. Well, I wouldn't ask for it now. Yeah. No, but the permission slip lists it. it so does. what they said lists yes everything. to lists all yeah. of them. I just I want families that. thinking we're, we're doing something. But I want to ask, we, I them. say we don't even go for consent on the symptomatic until we go for consent mm -hmm. at the app. We have, do they have to opt in to the at home? So, yes. Yes. So is that the so, same form? Yes. So, so let me explain. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> So the consent form that is basically the CIC's developed form for the DESI program has all three pooled testing, symptomatic, and test and stay on it. You cannot change it. So parents have asked, and, and I've tried to explain it as I am now um, in individual conversations, and now hopefully to everyone who's watching, um, that right now their consent online is simply for the test and stay program because that's all this body has voted, voted to participate right. yep. in 
Um, should we possibly tonight change that, you're voting that the district, and I would put that right in the motion, that the district participate in symptomatic testing. Mm -hmm. But that does not mean, or um, excuse me, let me revise that. The district participate in symptomatic testing and have then our nurses for students still contact families to see if they would be interested in symptomatic um, testing, you know, should that occasion arise for their child. Right. On an individual. Not an individual. No, right the, I mean, the consent, the 415 people in essence have consented, but we will still ask for it individually each time it yeah. arises. Yeah. Because I think that's the, but then we ask for consent for the op, for the opt-in. So the so okay. so that's the second part. Okay. The opt-in is something that is separate, and we would have to the district East Long Meadow would have to figure out a way to take the Desi word form and make it somewhat operational, so that we can hopefully have an electronic consent or opt in to this program. And then if they opt in, basically what they're saying is we would like to be part of the distribution process and receive every two weeks a rapid antigen home test. Per child? Two per, per student. Uh, you have, well, it's two per kit. Uh, I suppose they could do it yeah, if they have multiple children. Yeah. Well, because um, it's supposed to be one. That's why it's every week. So you have the option to test once per week with two in the yeah. kit. So per student. So each student would receive yeah. two a packet of two yeah. every other week. Each right. Student. If yeah. they opt in. Yep. yep. And then the obligation of participating is should you test positive that you are reporting that to your child's nurse's office at the school. Fair enough. And then obviously you would go through the, the five day isolation. Then everything else kicks in. But I guess my question is, what happens to those individuals still who are deemed a close contact at school? They, if they're not vaccinated and they we don't- They do the home test. They get one. They would have to test for five- Yeah, so that's why days. I would say you won't, don't wanna necessarily um, totally dismiss test and stay. You can still have that as an option. Yeah, I mean, I think we see how many students we right. have in the test and state because if it's only we have 415. We have 415. There are half of them were vaccinated. So you don't know that. We don't know that. But I don't know. So that's what I'm saying. We have to right. see how we, are. we have to see the numbers. Yeah. Right. I just said whether it's worth keeping continuously. Correct. The numbers will. I mean, we don't know really how many um, individuals you know over the next few weeks are going to even be able to participate. Uh, do they have they consented? Are they a close contact? Or actually, you reverse that. Mm -hmm. Have you identified as a close contact? Have you consented? Yeah. Um, the reality is, last week we had one. Were we up and running? So that's going to be an interesting um, path that uh, we will go through. Um, one thing that I've uh, been really negligent on is that I think uh, Kelly Lombard, our nurse leader, who was at the vaccine clinic, probably is in the audience. Oh, she is and, now, yeah. And if we can bring her in. Um, she is, I'm sure she would too. love to participate in this, <laughs> in this debate and or discussion. I, mean, I don't have an, a concern about bringing on additional means of keeping kids and families in school. My concern is more confusing right. or causing it's, confusion. It's very families. confusing. Hi, Kelly. Especially because... Hi, hi Kelly. Hi, sorry. Kelly. So, that was um, my fault. Sorry, Kelly. That's okay. <laughs> Just because they don't... Uh, yeah, 415 people who said yes to one thing. And then I just don't want anyone to think that if we move towards this, that they've automatically said yes to symptomatic because it's all in the same permission. We're not going to ask them until they're identified as, well, they would be identified as symptomatic. They go to yeah. the nurse and the nurse would have to call. I would say we don't go out with another I, We can't. Consent. That's not the way no, it's Because we're going to do it once and then twice. Do that way. But I would wait once we get the at home, then we do the opt-in form. That would be the next one that goes out. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The, we the, have to add the symptomatic in order to get to Yes. That's so, the only reason why we're doing it. Ke Kelly, just to bring you up to speed, and you may have been following along, and hopefully it's making sense. Um, we were explaining the test and stay program. We were explaining the fact that we have about 415 or more 
people who have consented. We've also spoken about the fact that uh, the online consent form is confusing because it has the other programs, pool testing and symptomatic testing explained on it. And, and we have no way to revise that, um, but we we're reaffirming for our families that right now, all that the East Long Meadow Public Schools are participating in is the test and stay program. And um, if we were to vote to move towards symptomatic testing, that we would certainly be calling, should a, a child come down with symptoms, we would call that parent and before moving ahead with any kind of um, rapid antigen test in that scenario. Correct. Um, so the symptomatic testing then would allow, if the, if the board um, or the committee just chooses to vote that way, would allow us to take the survey, which puts us in the mix for onboarding for the home testing program. Yep. That, that's, that's where we are. Mm -hmm. Does that seem like a logical uh, path, Kelly, to you? Yes, I was getting not nervous, but here we were having three new staff start with the CICS, and we only had one close contact last week, which is a good thing. Um, so from what I read, Desi wants to focus in on symptomatic staff and students and, and get away from the close contact tracing because 96% of the kids that were identified across Massachusetts as being a close contact were negative. Yeah, I know. Yeah. But Remember when it was six feet? Yeah. yeah. Remember? Yeah. Gordon, masks yeah. or six feet? Yeah, yeah I, I remember. <laughs> so again, I think all of this makes good sense. I just, I still have concerns for people who are close contacts outside of school. Like we're still basically saying vaccines are the only way back in, or you've got to sit out of school six days, five, well, come back on school. No, I mean, they, they, yeah, well, I mean, we, test, though. the only way we know about um, close contacts yeah. outside of school, or we're still getting them through our health department. Correct, Kelly? Yes. And parents are letting the nurses know. Yeah. So yeah, we don't have a remedy for that. That's a good, that's a good point. Yeah. We don't have a, we don't have a it's remedy a for that yet because yeah. it's a single test. So, and we wouldn't once a week currently, we don't accept. What's the point of that? Why, why is this once a week though? Cause this does, this isn't going to help us. Oh, no, it and does. It, it, it basically gives you one day. It, yes. And basically it just gives you a baseline every week of where you're. So your it's kind of like shifting. Pool yeah, but I thought if you were either home. symptomatic or direct contact, you could use at home testing instead of test and stay mm -hmm. no. no 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 forget it then never mind i mean it gives access to our families <laughs> to free at home tests it's this is about freeing up the nurses test all the symptomatic people now that's yeah. the way it only is. if they <laughs> yeah <laughs> but that's the way that's the way it's set up that's, there's, there's got to be some that's why it's that's why it's confusing in terms of like a policy well, it's right. silly i mean if we're, if we're gonna supplant Test and stay. We should supplant it and give five tests to them, to the kids, we, but we would so have they to... go through their five day period. Yes. And come to school every day after they test, because we're giving the same test we would give them here. Exactly. But right? that's not the way they set it up. Yeah. I know. That's yeah, not. Yeah. That's not the Desi program. Stay not the Desi protocol. I, I don't have that many tests to offer people. Right. right. This is so, but time. do we have to going back to where you're saying everybody would get? one box that has two tests in it every other week yeah we yeah. have to do that or can we just hold on to them no, instead you have of well, you they're going to have they're gonna stack them in their their medicine cabinet gonna, that they yeah. forget about them but then do we give them to Anita. i don't know yeah it's just, well, not, if we have the capacity if we as a board have the ability to go to say, hey, okay, we're going to accept at home testing. Yes, that's the whole point of it. That's Otherwise, not what the point of this it? is, though. That's a, this is no, a, this, this is, is this different. is taking pool home test testing is not instead of testing. No, no, this is taking pool testing it and is. basically saying now you do it yourself. Yeah, pool testing. Silly. So but that's gonna, what it is. If we're going to say it's well, okay, well, we're going to yeah, accept it. Why can't the difference? So the difference is five days later, oh, there was COVID in that classroom five days ago. The difference is that pool testing you don't know because it's a pool. Yeah, who the positive was, 
in home testing program, you're talking about one individual, that individual is identified, obviously, and we know whether that individual is positive or negative. At, but we also do know that timing is everything when it comes to taking a COVID test, That's whether right. that's a PCR or a rapid at home or right. an antigen, whatever it is. Yep. So you could take that one test on a Tuesday. And, and Wednesday, by year. Wednesday, you could be asymptomatic. And is that a strategy so, that they're encouraging is take everyone that opts in should take it once a week, regardless of anything else? Any That's other the things. theory behind it. Is that yes. what it's for? That's or is it for it, yeah. you're allowed one a week, test, you don't need you know, it, keep test, it for next week? Test once a week? No, the, the oh. theory is a test once a week. I don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> At this point, I think we should t stay with the test. And I don't Gordon, what do you want to do? I don't I, know. Can we, I, I think, can we say um, we're interested in doing it, start the process, and then say, no, we don't? So at least the process is being processed. Well, we either get into symptoms. No, you no. either go or not. Well, you can't change. No. Yeah, I mean, can you start it and opt out? Yes, but each one takes a number of weeks yeah. to get going. Well, so I mean, we're not even up fully and running and test and stay. Let's just do um, test and stay. It, do, it just offers, it offers another option for your families. That's it. It's not it, does. it offers another option for your families. It's not the panacea. Yeah. It's not going to solve everything, no. but it offers another option. And the unfortunate thing was we got into test and stay right when they decided we're going to launch home testing. Yeah. So it became really confusing. Okay. Mm -hmm. What is, yeah. what is the value of this or value of that? No. I'm sorry. No. They're not going to no. stop test and stay. No, no they're and just, we'll they're just putting, point. They're just putting pressure to move towards home testing. They're trying to take the pressure off the nurses in school. Yeah, but it doesn't change anything. Yeah. I didn't say it did, but that's what the theory is. It's silliness. This is just silly. I think it doesn't again, change anything. Why, no, they, why they, they said you, know, you can stop if, if they're participating. You can stop close contact tracing. Right. That's what it changes. That's what that's yeah, only you don't have to go in here. and, and the do the close well, contact. That's the same. Right. <laughs> same thing. Because we don't have the close contact. Those that are vaccinated. That's what I'm saying. Why so the, the, the vaccine, vaccination has nothing to do no, with it this, doesn't. in this. Um, yes, it does because you just said it doesn't. It only would take away the close contact testing in the school. No, no, no. What it what it does is, if uh, you're participating in this program, basically you're saying to the nurses they no longer have to close contact trace. Yeah. You can move away from that. It, Desi's giving them the the liberty to move away from that. Okay, but then no one would qualify for test and stay. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So why would you keep test and stay? Well, it's it's, it it's a moot point. You, if is. you're not keeping it, you're not getting rid of it. It's just there. It's just okay. there. It like you're not really. Nick, but, you got Ke yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know if Kathy Riddle. Okay. Yeah, this is not me. Just so, what do you guess? What do you want to do, Gordon? What do you think? I, I think it's it's just another option. So if you're interested in participating, it, and Kelly, I would certainly defer and, yeah. and love to hear your thoughts on it. It, outside of families, I always thought symptomatic testing gave an option for staff who consented. If they were not feeling well, for whatever reason, they could go and get a test and then they can feel more confident that they either do not have COVID or they do have COVID and move into the protocols needed. That, that was one of the reasons why back in December, I had um, recommended symptomatic uh, but Kelly, please. Uh, so thoughts. I had a staff meeting with all the nurses and they would like to do symptomatic testing and home testing. And they, you know, they were like, why are we doing tests and stay? And I said, because that's what we voted on and we have to follow through unless, you know, you guys change your mind. So um or in this case, just add another program. I just think well, it yeah. makes more sense because remember when we had so many close contacts, it would have been perfect for us to have that. But now last week we had one, one close contact. And really that's what we've been talking about, that we shouldn't have close contacts if we're following our protocols. Oh, well, we're good. Ah. Yeah, because we did. Yeah. <laughs> like we were. But less. But so, Kelly, are you saying we should not be doing the test and stay at all? I just don't nice. think there's going to be a lot of kids. I mean, you know, yeah. the, the uh, positives are down. Um, like I said, only one close contact. I, yeah. I don't know. It doesn't make sense. I don't think to put all that energy into test and stay when we don't have the students to test. Do you need to stay in test and stay to get the at home? 
No, you just have to. No, you have to. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, like, I I wouldn't recommend a motion that gets you know, rid of gets test rid of no, test no, and no, stay. No, I no. would just mm -hmm. if if to you're at it. if you're thinking of going the direction of home testing, then you just basically add symptomatic testing. Yeah. So the staff can handle symptomatic, Kelly. That they have to consent, just like families. Yeah. Yeah. So the staff. Like oh, our staff. I'm sorry. I did good, speak good to the program staff. coordinator for CIC, and I told her that there was a school committee meeting tonight, and that we were going to discuss. And she said that their staff could help us. There's some of the nurses that would like to do their own, you know, do it in the health room, but there's some health rooms that are busier than others. Right. So yeah. We still use the staff from CIC and they did provide all of the um, PPE that we need. I think but if we're going to go this way. route, oh, sorry, Kelly. I think no, if we're going to go this route, then we need to really think about what we're accepting then right. in terms of, of kids who are, if a family is self-reporting, my child was a close contact and now we are not currently letting them come to school if they're not vaccinated and they were close contact out of school, but we're gonna accept and these at rapid home. at homes. And I think we have to try to strike some balance because we're kind of contradicting ourselves. Well, why else would we offer an at-home program if we weren't gonna accept that as a result? As a, well, you're, because you're, you're serving two different purposes. Right, <clears throat> all, the, all the home testing program is serving is whether you are positive or not. The, the close contact because they won't have five tests in a row at their from disposal. In most, in most cases, they're not going to have at their disposal five tests in a row. Well, what if they bought them? Would we accept them? We don't right now. So, okay. so that's not technically part of the program. It's not. Okay. Um, you know, down the road as we get going, I can certainly research whether an individual school committee can decide to accept yeah. that. I just think well, that needs to be like our next action step. Like if we're going to go forward with symptomatic and at home, then I think in order to be, I don't know, transparent, fair, whatever you want to call it, like then we should also be considering ways that we would go about collecting information from families if they're self-reporting that their child was a close contact yeah. and they are willing to test for five consecutive days and yeah. report that, yeah. then they should be able to come to school if we're opting to say at home tests count for something. Kelly, yeah, what do you think about that, Kelly? Um, so I think the home tests are good at uh, determining if somebody's positive. So if there's a home test and it's positive, we're going with their positive. But then if you have a kid that's negative, but presents with all of the symptoms of COVID, the fever, the, you know, shortness of breath, all of that, even if they're negative, we're going to send them for a PCR because why do they have all those symptoms? The, um, the symptomatic testing is more for, um, you know, somebody has congestion, somebody has a, a headache, or somebody has um, uh, a runny nose with no other symptoms. And if we test them in school and they're negative, they can stay. But the ones that have the full blown, all the symptoms and they test negative, we're still going to send those kids home because sure. they could be positive and they should have a PCR, which is the gold standard so, test. But, yeah. but Kelly, if we're accepting now test and stay, close contact, go to test and stay, negative PCR test uh, or antigen test, you can stay. Can we make the same logical assumption that close contact, no symptoms, uh, at home antigen test? Come on in. How do we know they're doing the tests though? They you so you're and who would they get the tests from? Because we're only getting oh, we'll give them one. They got one five per, week per student or per staff. But I think if you're if you have a family, for instance, who is offering that information to you, like we have to think about this. Mm -hmm. If it's a close contact out of school, dance, sports, anything, if you have that happening and a family is offering you that information and Substantively saying, my kid is now out of school for five days. I'm willing to test them every single day and send you the results. I mean, yeah. a parent yeah, just because say, for they every kid family it. that does, cool. there's multiple I think, families that I think that we aren't. need to research it. Yeah, I think yeah. so too. I, you know, I, I don't get that's the only thing that puts value to it to me right. because yeah. testing everyone once a week is that's not like, worth it. No. I'm not into, you know, what are we going to get out of that? But I, I think that's the program. 
Yeah, well, no, I didn't realize that. Yeah, so the again, the, the, the piece the that we have to research that, is that I I am I don't have, know of any other district that's doing that. I'm that's, not saying that, there is. I just think that's like, accepting you know five in a row at home. But that's what we do here. We should. But that's it's my the, point. it's tests at home. But we it's don't. Stay, Nor does any you other. You said that we were trying to get away from close contacts in schools. Right, we're trying Des, to get away from No, Desi's trying to take the load off the right. Nurses. So if we no longer have close contact identification in, in school, school, then why does at home matter? And if it matters at home, why yeah, not so, take the so results the, of the same test we're giving a test? The reality say, is, just trust the parents that they have a negative. Just how like we have to trust that they got the vaccination. So, so there's, <clears throat> excuse me, there's the reality, is that you're probably going to have fewer parents call in and say my child's a close contact you might still we still would get the health department letting us know who the close contacts are but you you know if we go to home testing all they have to really report is whether they're positive or right not. right that's all they have to volunteer Which is what you're and saying if they, yes, he's trying to get to correct and so if they if they report that they're positive they have to isolate anyway right any positive test is going to keep them out of school correct mm -hmm. antigen pcr <clears throat> but we accept the antigens in school we should accept them at home. Are they available now at like CBS? Do we know tests? Yeah, they're getting. Them I mean, they're they're becoming more available. Yeah. yeah. So can there's, there's so many variables involved because what if you have a family of six and you have one positive, and everyone else is being exposed to that positive? At least in school, that positive is not in school anymore, so nobody's being exposed to that student. So there's no way we can weigh in on home because we don't know all the variables, who's positive, who's vaccinated. So I don't think we could do that. I don't think we could accept if they had five days of negative, they could come to school. We accept it right now though, to return on day six, yes. a negative on day five. Right. Yeah, PCR. Right. That is our if PCR. If no, positive. not PCR, at home. Yeah, we can do it at home. Um, so but do you, do you I'm see, just trusting them. I feel like we're accepting at home tests for some things, but we're not accepting them for others. And if we move towards more at home options, we're still not necessarily supporting the group that is going to be out of school. That that's where I'm just confused. Yeah, right. like we're trying to be more inclusive to keeping right. kids in the classroom. Any of these shifts we make still doesn't provide any kind of entry point to people who are not choosing to vaccinate their child is how I see it. And maybe I'm well, looking at yeah, this from the wrong right. lens. If no, you need right. a negative antigen test to be in school. PCR. Then, no, but right now oh, you're yes, saying yes, antigen. Yep. Then why doesn't an antigen test count to stay in right. school? Yeah. That's what, and it just, it would count it, that, it's not part of the DESI program. That's right. basically what. We can't yeah, invent our own rules. rules. Oh, we can definitely invent our own but rules. I think that's <laughs> what we're all about. Yeah. But I think if we're going to move forward with changing and making an, a motion tonight to move into at home yeah. and symptomatic, then we should do our due diligence and do some research to see if we can opt into accepting or create our own motion to let families submit at home tests in those five days. Because if not, then we're not really letting anybody back into school that isn't already Otherwise, going to school. Right. We're basically saying no, those who can, can. I mean, I think basically don't, it's don't. going to become a legal opinion. It is because it is. I've done some, I've tried to do some reading on this and nowhere do I see where anything would be accepted from, like to your point, the five state straight right. at home test. Right. I can't find anything that says that's acceptable. It may not be there. Mm -hmm. It may well, not be part start, of it. I think we should start the process. Yeah. And then we can always Especially go Kelly's to you know, do our due diligence on whatever it is we need to look up and then add it to it after. But I think the first question is, to your point, can they test, use their own test at home on days three, four, two, three, four, and five, right? Yeah, I think you know that's what I mean? like what we need to that's take what as talking next about. step. <laughs> because because one test a week. Six. I think by the time we get to it, would that might already be decided, I bet. Correct. So I'll move that we participate in... Uh, uh, the symptomatic testing district wide, um, including having nurses uh, and the staff contact students, families the day of, also to uh, participate in the home testing program as the lining up of the scheduling permits. 
I second that. Okay, motion made by Greg, second by Beth. Any further discussion? Is that, is that enough, Gordon? Are you are we there? Are we making yeah. it Kelly? Does that make it better, you think? If we do the I think it does. Okay. All right. Yeah. But we're not opting out in that motion of no. test and stay. No. Just making sure we'll we'll keep there. moving forward with test and stay, as far as I understand the motion. Yes. But what it does is it allows me now to submit the survey to start the onboarding process for um, the home testing program. It also allows our nurses to, should there be someone who comes into the health office with symptoms, to ask if they consent, if it's an adult, or call home to get consent mm -hmm. to do a rapid antigen test at that moment and determine whether that person can go on with their day at school or should be going home. So just want to let you know that we can't take a verbal consent, but if the parent goes on and signs on electronically, you know, or we've does a paper that. form. Or yeah. the, oh, but if it's an elementary, if it's an elementary parent, they're going to be coming to the school anyway, right. and they can sign right. off yeah. right exactly. then. Well, we have copies in the office. They can sign off right there. Yeah, we have paper Thank ones, you. electronic. So as somebody who then consented to test and stay, I sign up electronically, then I have to come pick up my kid who's going to be tested for symptomatic now, and I have to sign another permission slip, even though I already signed one already. Yes, you do. Correct. Well, Kelly, we can do it online, you said, right? You can't uh, do it online. Because yes, you signed I, it. I was told that if you do it online, it takes three days to show up. <laughs> but listen, we have paper ones so they can fill them out. And all the nurses have copies of paper right. consent for staff and students in their health rooms. I'm going to miss this yeah, it's not as helpful. As it's I, not as helpful because now my kid, I still have to come to the school to get my kid, even though I've consented to something yeah, online. So I feel like in some ways, those 415 together. people who well, already said yes. Go around it, though. We need yeah. consent. Yeah, but. <laughs> Especially if we've told them that what they're consenting for right now is testing not state. Exactly. Right. Correct. Is what it is. So now, now, as I as I did say in my communication home, that should they should we change, I would update that for everyone so that they understand. I don't yeah. think they can go back in and consent electronically. No. I don't believe so, but we'll check that out. Yeah. Okay. All right. You, you still have a little on the phone, sir. Okay. How was the clinic tonight? Uh, 51 participants. They had 45 registered and we had some people that walked in. We also gave, we also gave out KN95s or the, the Board of Health did. I helped them. Um, and a test kit for each household oh, wow. if they cool. registered. Were there students there, Kelly? Yes, there were. Oh, good. Great. Some were getting boosters. Some were getting their first shot. So... All right, we so have another motion. clinic on the 28th, I'm sorry, no, no, on the 28th, correct? Yes, three to six okay. in the Birchland Park Library. All right, so we had a motion made by Greg, it was seconded by Beth. Any further discussion? Do you think we should have like a, a health information night after this starts so that families or like have a centralized location so we can let them have permission slips if that's the only way they can opt in? Or I just... I don't know. I think, I think, this, is very I think this is going to be a limited number of people that are, are going to be I tweaking so now too. and the app at home opt in. Once we get to the at home opt in, then, then we, we have to send it all out. A massive again. amount of yeah. communication. Yeah. It's, we're talking months. We'll be all right. At least. We had 415 people in two weeks. <laughs> so I'm just saying. But, like, but not direct contacts or symptomatic. No, but people test who were interested. During school. Mm. Yeah. So Two I think, I think you're going to see this number go up because people are going to want access to the home tests. So I don't yes. think it's, that's what but this is. This isn't the avenue for the home test. No, but I think again, you're going to see. Yeah. We're going to give them that chance when we're ready for home test. We're going to back out to all the families and ask them. Right. Because okay. we have to. Right. Yeah. All, all right. right. So that was an easy one, right? <laughs> <laughs> all those in favor say aye. 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 Oppose nay. And that motion carries five to zero. Okay. We'll try to unravel the confusion as we go. So, I, it is confusing, and I, and I appreciate everyone's patience as well as our family's patience. It's just impressive how we're going on. I'm thinking you're talking about um, 
uh, Nick, you, you know, being in Spartanum your sophomore year and that moment in time when you guys finished that Spartanum and you went home. Yeah. And it's been since then. Right. Okay. And we're still, this, the whole, it just boggles my mind that it's still being figured out. Because that's the guidance we're getting. <laughs> it's a, it's or amazing. lack thereof. A long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> you were a little years. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Kelly, thank, thank you so much. Yep. Thank Thanks, you. Kelly. Appreciate thank it. You for having me. Thank you. All right, Gordon, are you taking us through the gift donations? I can take you through the gift donations. You probably need a, um, a motion oh, yes. to table. table. Move that we table the FY22 second quarter financial report. Motion made by Bill. Second. Second by Ansnella. Any further discussion? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed nay. And that motion carries 5 to 0. All okay. right, yes. Okay, just, so in um, your excuse me, I just mentioned to Nick he might want to go home soon because I guess it's starting to freeze outside a little bit. So well, I need it. I know. Yeah. 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 More important than that. <laughs> okay. Good luck on the yeah. exams tomorrow. Good luck yeah. on the studying yeah. tonight. Um, if you could just write a paper on how to communicate the testing <laughs> program, <laughs> I'd appreciate that. You can get an automatic A for the year. Okay. <laughs> if you get it to them by tomorrow afternoon, that'd be appreciated. Okay. A, video, a video presentation would be nice. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, in your packets, uh, we do have uh, a memo from Dr. Allen at uh, Birchland Park Middle School, and he would like uh, to have approval on a check from Grin and Barrett Enterprises for $2,937.32. This will be deposited into Birchland Park's gift account for future use. I move to accept the check in the amount of $2,937.32 from Grin and Barrett to be put into the gift account at Birch and Park Middle School. All right, motion made by Beth. Second. Second by Bill. Any further discussion? All right, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed nay. And the motion carries by zero. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, next, we have a similar type uh, gift and check from Grin and Barrett. This is at Maple Shade. And the amount is for five hundred dollars, and this would go into Maple Shades gift account. All right. Okay, I move to accept the five hundred dollars um, for Grin and Barrett to Maple Shade School to go into their gift account. Motion made by Beth. Second. Second by Antonella. Any further discussion? Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed nay. And that motion carries five to zero. Thank you. Okay. All right. Moving on to old business. Yes. Fiscal year 2023 budget development. So, um, unfortunately, uh, Mrs. Blair can't be with us this evening, but I'm going <coughs> to do my best to. Uh, usually, we have a um, collaborative approach to this uh, re this uh, presentation, uh, but I will walk us through, and I'm sure we'll have a uh, very substantive discussion. Um, in your packet, we did look at this discussion this year a little bit differently uh, probably mostly because this year uh, the state is incredibly fiscally strong and they have um, decided to um, in their budget the governor's budget uh, which is the first one to come out to increase, uh, first fully fund the Student Opportunity Act, which helped uh, increase Chapter 70 for a number of districts, but also take a look just in the foundation budget um, at certain specifics, uh, such as, as you go down the bullet points on that first sheet, um, looking at uh, low income. Um, and so in the, the governor's preliminary budget, our chapter 70 is designated to increase by possibly $854,666, which is a, a significant increase. Um, I believe it's 7%, 7 increase uh, in terms of the chapter 70 we receive. So this is the money that comes in through the town, through all municipalities, but it's earmarked since it's the chapter 78 for education or for schools. Um, just to give you 
a, a basic idea of how this is all determined in the foundation budget. Foundation budget looks at enrollment. That's the October 1 deadline um, for all districts. As of October 1, they look at your foundation budget enrollment, what schools have in terms of their enrollment. And that enrollment then dictates a good deal of what type of chapter 70 increase you're going to get the next year. Um, they have a wage adjustment factor. They have a factor for inflation. They're also looking at um, things such as in terms of the local contribution, the municipality's contribution, property value, income, and municipal revenue growth. Uh, this year, our October 1, we did have an increase in our enrollment of approximately 78 students. Um, talking about, I'm just going through, I'm not going through all of the bullets, um, but you know, they're in this budget, there is an inflation factor that's incorporated uh, of 4.51%, um, specifically on the uh, employee benefits, uh, which is important because you know that's one of the areas that increases significantly faster than some of the other areas of the budget, and then 4.5% on other areas. We do know that in December, um, that December closed with an inflation or at least the consumer price index of around 7%. But I think overall inflation for the year was somewhere around 5.1%. Um, in terms of our town, we know, as we've discussed in the past, right now, East Long Meadow is in strong, in strong fiscal shape. Uh, they have free cash certified at 5.6 million. They have in their stabilization fund, 3.4 million. Um, tax rate is down at $20.29 per thousand. So it's down 77 cents from the uh, rate last year of 21.06. Um, one of the fears over my tenure and I'm sure prior to my tenure has always been, um, they worry about creeping up to that ceiling of $25 per thousand. Um, and so we're moving the right direction from that 25. Our bond rating is the highest that it's been um, at AA plus. Property values continue to increase. Um, the best news is that revenues are coming in at least at the estimated level, if not higher. Um, and similar to us with ESSER funding, the town has had ARPA um, funding, federal funding that um, they've had access to and uh, that's allowed not only uh, for reimbursement for things like uh, PPE on the town side and other COVID related spending. <clears throat> it also has allowed for infrastructure projects to get moving um, and become something that uh, is acted upon and accomplished as opposed to something that's still in the planning stage. Can I ask the number of students? Sure. I know enrollment's up. So we back to where we were before pretty we much. We are not back to where we were uh, yeah. pre pre-pandemic. Okay. Uh, we're just under 2,500 students district-wide. Mm -hmm. We still have a decent number of homeschool students, more mm -hmm. than we had in a pre-pandemic. So do we think that's still probably COVID-related? I think some of it's yeah. COVID-related, okay. yeah. Right. I, I think, uh, yeah, I'll just okay. leave it at that. Yeah. Is it legal to reach out and ask them why? I mean, you can always ask why. A lot of times uh, they'll indicate why in the letter that okay. they send with okay. the plan. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, so I can say that, yes, some is COVID related. Okay, mm -hmm. it. Um, thank you. Yeah. Now, just because when they say our student numbers are down, you know, want to know that we're still working on this COVID thing and the pandemic and parents feeling comfortable and childcare issues and all that. So that's why I asked. Sure, no, it's a great question. Um, the next page just gives you an idea of where our chapter 70 has been over the last um, seven years or so from FY16 to um, the estimated FY23. And then off of the chapter 70, um, where the town's contribution has been, um, and then together, that's what meets the full budget. Um, and the town has to obviously contribute a certain amount for us to meet net school spending. So just taking a look, if you look at um, just the last two years, um, last year with the Student Opportunity Act, we just were increased the minimal amount, which was $30 per student with our enrollment. And so that increased our chapter 70 
by $73,710, um, which is only a 0.6% increase, relatively small comparatively when you look, if you jump over FY21 and you go back FY16 through FY20, it, uh, certainly a, the, one of the lowest increases with the exception of FY16. Um, if you go all the way across, just so you're reading this chart, the town uh, put in 2% uh, last year in terms of their increase for the net school spending. Um, we had 0.6% increase chapter 70, they put in 2% overall. That's what um, ultimately went into um, our final budget figures. The point of looking at this chart was just to get an idea, one of where chapter 70 has been over the last seven years, but also just to get an idea also of where the town's contribution has been. And so they've averaged roughly over the last seven years around 1.8%. Um, and as we go through and we continue to talk about uh, what we would like to hopefully achieve in this budget process, um, that's gonna come back and, and be a significant uh, number in terms of just the average. As this might be the year, and you've heard uh, the town manager say it, that um, we're in a very strong fiscal position. Departments maybe have uh, now the opportunity to grow. Uh, two years ago, when we were all trying to figure out where the pandemic might take us from a fiscal standpoint, there was a lot of anxiety. Um, but the reality is that uh, we didn't have the funding cliffs, and thankfully some of that's due to the fact that uh, we did have federal grants that came in. However, in FY21 um, and now FY22 at the state level, tax revenue has exceeded what um, their estimates were. Um, I believe that the tax revenue uh, is has grown at the state level somewhere in the neighborhood of 5.1%. Um, and so they are, they are in a, a very good position. The, the governor's budget not only is increasing chapter 70, but it's also increasing their stabilization fund at the state level um, to an all-time high. Chapter 70 is being increased at an all-time high. Stabilization is being increased at an all-time high. And then um, one other piece that I learned um, in a presentation on Friday from the tax, Massachusetts Taxpayers Association is that um, the governor is putting forth his budget uh, and in a parallel version, um, also putting out the second round of um, federal funding in terms of that ARPA money that goes to municipalities. They still have 43% of that money available. And so that's in the billions of dollars that will come out to continue to support municipalities as they go forward in FY23 and FY24. So similar to ESSER 3, municipalities are going to have a considerable amount of money in addition to a budget that's pretty strong um, that's being put forth by uh, the governor right now. Historically, and I, I think uh, Mr. Fonseca probably would support this, the um, chapter 70 that's proposed by the governor generally is not reduced incredibly as it goes then through the House and then through the Senate um, and gets into those budget discussions. If you look at history, um, the House usually, when they get to their, their part of it, they usually, to Gordon's point, don't really touch chapter 70. Historically, if there's any increases that comes out of the Senate and then it goes to the Ways and Means, which is a combination of both House and Senate, and they flesh it out. Historically, they haven't always given the final budget to the governor that includes the Senate's increase, but they don't go back to the governor's numbers. They meet in the middle somewhere. So I think this is a very healthy and optimistic version of Chapter 70 right now. And I'll be cautiously optimistic that says when the state really gets into their discussions, it might go up a little bit. And history supports that. So we're, we're sitting in a, a very strong fiscal position. Uh, and the hope is that uh, the conversations that we started back in January with the town council will continue in a collaborative way where we can grow. Uh, last two years, our overall budget has been in the 1.5 or lower increase um, as a final increase. 
which unfortunately, when you're, you're dealing with a budget of our size and you're dealing with 80% of it being salary, uh, it generally means when you have contractual obligations that you're going to be reducing. And we did. Over the last two years, we've reduced and we were down a number of positions um, in FTEs. And we've highlighted those in any number of discussions. So I'm not going to go through that piece again. But what I would like to highlight is as we move forward in these discussions, um, we know that bringing forward contractual obligations uh, with the current staff we have, and that would include, and this is something that I want to make sure that we highlight in a number of ways, uh, two adjustment counselors that we hired at the elementary level um, who are servicing at Maple Shade and Mountain View at the three through five grade levels. Um, if we move them within that contractual obligation, you're looking at about a 2.51% increase over our current budget. What we'd like to do is not only do that, but also then uh, look at growing back and regaining FTEs. Um, some might be named differently now, uh, but that can really help us move as a district forward based on the needs we're seeing. Um, one, the high school assistant principal. This would really help the high school move forward on its testing program, which it's finally um, settled in on looking at the PSAT, but probably more importantly, as we're thinking about social and emotional um, learning and how that's integral to the academic piece, move to a house structure uh, and really work with their guidance counselors where they have one assistant principal working with two guidance counselors and concentrating on ninth and 10th grade. And probably that would be the, the assistant principal who oversees the PSAT program. And then another guidance, excuse me, assistant principal overseeing uh, and working with 11th and 12th. And so you're transitioning, you're focusing on transition to high school and academic planning and really career and college planning. And then you're focusing on exiting high school and making those plans happen. Um, and it's something that uh, can really personalize it much more so than the current structure we have uh, and allow that group to start to work with teachers and hopefully make it even more personalized for our students. Um, so that's something if we can bring back that assistant principal, we can start to make happen. And it, it's very effective. It's something actually I've done as a principal of a high school um, when you have an opportunity like this where you can move to two assistant principals and we know that there's a need. Um, Birchland Park is looking at bringing a unit A position back. They did lose two unit A positions. This is, uh, the title is not um, specific to the unit A positions that they lost, but. This would be a student intervention coordinator. And what basically they're looking to do is they're looking to have a licensed teacher who can start to work with not only the administrators and the counselors, but very closely with, in addition to our social and emotional teacher, um, students who might be our most at risk students, both for social and emotional reasons, but certainly academic reasons. Um, oversee some of the things that we already have going. We already um, are using Panorama, we're already using iReady, but work with this group to really make sure that the interventions are specific to the needs of the students. Um, one of the things that uh, was pretty significant in the discussions that we had with the buildings as we were going through the budget process was just taking a snapshot of Birchland's history. Um, if we just talk about uh, situations of student need and maybe disruption to the learning process, at January, if you go back to 2017, 2018, they had 94 such incidents. Moving forward, 2018, 2019, they had 115. Um, 2019, 2020, they had 119. Fast forward to this year, they have 229. So we know that students are or have more needs and we need to figure out how we can better support them. Um, 
And this was a, a position that can certainly help them start to coordinate and do a better job with how we utilize coaching, how do we utilize um, interventions, and how we communicate with families, specifically with families who may have students who are the neediest. Um, you've heard this next uh, request the last few years, but it probably makes even more sense this year. Uh, this is now taking a position we have, but we share between the two, three through five elementary schools, the elementary math coach and interventionist. Um, we put on interventionist there because our, our coaches are helping with intervention. Um, and right now we have one coach who's stretched very thinly between two schools. And, and we think we can do a better job, uh, specifically in math in this case, we know that we've lost a literacy coach that's something that we hope over the next few years we can build back. But in this case, these are the key positions we hope to recover for next year. Um, and math is where we have a significant mm -hmm. need. And so this would allow both buildings to plan and utilize the services of an experienced coach who can also get into the interventions and help our staff do a better job and become more specific to the needs of our students. Uh, you know that we have an evaluation going on uh, of our preschool. That evaluation actually is starting to wrap up. So it is probably going to be an expansion of the preschool program. Uh, and what we would like to do is plan that over two years. Right now, we don't have a specific position that we would put into the budget, but um, most likely if the preliminary discussions we've had when they present the full report, uh, you're probably gonna need that third preschool classroom. So I would say that this most likely is gonna be a teaching position. Uh, and so currently we have it budgeted as such. Um, should that report change, we would obviously bring that forward. And, but what, the, what we're looking at, the group went out, not only looked at all of our processes, but they also then looked at four preschool models around us and are looking at to develop what were the best practices of each of those preschools. And so they looked at um, Windsor, Connecticut, they looked at Ludlow, they looked at Longmeadow, they looked at Hamden, Wilbraham, and they looked at, um, no, that's the four actually, sorry, yeah. <laughs> I was going to the fifth. Um, and they are looking now to put together what would be the best recommendations to make our program much more efficient. And one of the things that uh, we are doing right now is our preschool program is also um, very intertwined with our ASD program. And yet our ASD program services K to two as well. And so we're overwhelming almost two programs due to some um, very unique circumstances. And I'll leave it at that because I don't want to get into uh, anything that might identify individual students. Mm -hmm. We um, can physically find the space for another preschool. We can, kind of yeah. yep, that's we good. can. Uh, and that's something that uh, um, uh, our administrators at Meadowbrook are working on. Uh, and, and we'll also look at other options as we discuss, you know, are there other things that we can do in a district? Uh, but right now we can do that. We would take uh, most likely a room that's in the preschool area that's used for more related services. And we would have to find a spot for the related services. Uh, but there's some other things that we might be able to do that would take certain things off of Meadowbrook. Um, and so we're looking at possibly doing that too. And then finally, um, this is something that has been discussed in previous meetings, but um, if we're looking to stop sharing teachers and um, provide the the specials and the schedule that will allow home, uh, class homeroom teachers, excuse me, um, to have the ability to have collaborative planning when their their children are at specials, and also what they call a wind block, or whatever you need block, so that from collaborative planning, I have a window of time with my homeroom class where I might be able to reteach. I might be able to start to do things that can really target some of the needs that I'm identifying, but I'm not finding the time to get back at it. So to speak. Because there's always that pressure I really of like having that. to move forward. 
That's a good idea. What well, we achieved this year, and it was somewhat contrived, and, but I have to give our elementary principals um, incredible credit, given everything that they're trying to tackle. We did achieve collaborative planning, not to the level that we'd like to see it, um, but we have collaborative planning. We don't have the wind block across the board. Uh, we'd like to have that happen. And as we're doing this, we want to have a, a much better understanding of how we're utilizing all this time. Um, and so if you can give a schedule where you see it uniformly across um, and it's making sense to someone in August, you have a much better chance of using that time effectively for students than um, if it seems like it's sporadic and you know very contrived. Mm -hmm. So each year we want to improve. Um, these are the positions that we're hoping to uh, recover from or within this budget. And basically with these additions, it takes us to about a 3.9% overall increase. Um, we know that that's higher than we've seen in many years. We average generally somewhere in the 2% or below in terms of our increase. Um, in many cases, and if you're below two, uh, that means you're reducing, as we said at the beginning of this discussion. Um, you know, I will go back to the statement that uh, I made at the beginning of, of this presentation and that we've heard from others on the town side that this is a, a good year to possibly show and achieve some growth. Um, the, the next pages, next couple pages, really just give you an idea of how chapter 70 is calculated and that there are different categories um, in chapter 70 and they get weighted differently. Okay. So you, you know, you look at a preschool uh, child and the administration and instructional leadership and as you go across, there are different weights or really monetary value that are attributed to um, those different categories. And then when you flip the page and you see the chart for the estimated chapter 70 for FY23 for East Long Meadow, it, tells you, it shows you how it breaks out mm -hmm. um, in terms of how they actually develop that foundation budget. So we figured that that's, that's an important thing to have just to see how the different categories work. Um, and one of the things that we're seeing and one of the reasons why our chapter 70 has gone up significantly is that our low income students are now at a percentage of 29%. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's significantly higher than it's been in the past. Uh, that is an area that has been um, heightened in terms of monetary value in the foundation budget. And so that's contributing to our chapter 70 going up. And I do um, remember, not to interrupt one minute, I sure. do remember Lori Paul coming in and when she's spoken to us, she has made us aware of the fact that, <clears throat> excuse me, the low income numbers are rising because mm -hmm. there's right. benefits to the lunch program as right. well as yeah. um, right. our athletic fees. Right. So it all imp it impacts in more ways than just absolutely in this and, way. And, and, <clears throat> and to that point, um, you know, we know that poverty uh, creates incredible need and incredible um, often deficits. And so those are things that we were now dealing with in our classrooms. And those are things that um, we have to be sure that we have supports in place for students as, as they come into our buildings. Um, and so, you know, to the point of professional development, some of the things that we're doing, those are the types of things we're doing in professional development. We're not necessarily implementing any new curriculum, but um, we are, providing our teachers and staff skills and better understanding of students that they may now have in and do have in their classrooms so that they can structure learning environments that are supportive. Going to the final sheet in your packet or final few sheets, which is the uh, a sheet that you've seen for many years, and that's the town's um, spreadsheet for budget requests. Uh, it just breaks out all of what I've just said in a different way and um, gives you an idea of where the salary increases, um, but also shows in the notes, and we can certainly um, add more to that, but on the 
far right of that spreadsheet is where we usually give explanation for the town in terms of anything that might be new. Um, and so we certainly wanted to make sure that they know we're moving to adjustment counselors in that top line um, of teachers and unit A staff, teachers and nurses um, from the ESSER grant to the operational budget. With that said, the overall increase there is about a 2.4% increase. Gordon, what column are those two in right now in that line? What column? Of FTEs. They are, uh, for this purpose, they're actually in the operational budget, I believe. Right. Yeah. Which they're not. What do you mean they're not? <clears throat> they're not in our operating budget. No, so we move them out. We don't, is that, you're saying take them out of the 248, put them over in the, add them to the 3.68. Yeah, I mean, that's, isn't that actually what's happening? Yeah, but this is this is a projection for next year. But yeah, we can do that. No, isn't this this year plus the bottom is the new stuff, the 401? Correct, yep. Or five, I mean. So if we have put them in the incorrect column, we could correct that too, yeah. Because they really are in the 3.68, right? You would add to, yeah, so it'd be five yeah. points. But five. then they got to come down to the five and be seven. Correct. Then they get 406. So the 401 should be 399. Yep. So we'll make that change. Okay. Got it. Which I know, you know, I know, and I, I know a broken record on this, but dating yourself. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I, I do show. I, I date myself all the time on that. But I think having it in the notes called out specifically and talking about where they were funded this year supports with that. I think. Um, well, so, but this yeah. two five one isn't right either, no, though, in my opinion. I mean, it's where? On top of this this page. I mean, it, it says it in a way, but it's not really that two by one. Where? Which one are you on? The the I don't know that we're getting this. Anybody, no, this is more for. Um, it's the, we shouldn't worry. I don't think we should worry about that. Okay. I know we're, I, I know, I guess. Yeah. This is why it's in the discussion for all of you, so we know, yeah, what, I know. what you would like to this present is, to the yeah, town. I know, and I know, but and we can you can do it however you want. I'm just that's my. But no, we're we're going to do it the way the committee wants us yeah. to do it. That's why. So, that's why we're presenting. Well, so what you're submitting, what you're submitting is this. Eventually, we're well. We can submit more because right, I think the is idea is that we're yes, we're required to submit yeah. this sheet eventually, mm -hmm. and but we want to make sure that we're including all the information that you feel should be included, so that we can continue the discussion. When do you have to get something over to them? Well, they they feel that, um, or we have opened up the line of communication that we were going to give you preliminary numbers after this meeting. Okay. okay. Okay, so we're going to go to them with three point five percent. That's up to this group. We're, the we're, mm -hmm. Yeah, we're presenting. We're presenting okay. to you the recommendation from the leadership team. But I, um, and we feel that we're in a position to recover positions. These aren't positions that are really new. These are FTEs. Well, that we've I'd be careful with that, Gordon, because really they are. Because one of them's not. But I'd like putting that list out before, and then this li the list of. Uh, what is it? 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Mm -hmm. Only one of them is the same on the five. So I would, you know, I wouldn't say they're the one of them. The assistant principal, the math. Yeah. Isn't that the only one? No. Well, we've lost a coach. Or was it a reading so, coach? It was, but we're still, we're looking to recover because the needs right now are more significant in math. Mm -hmm. I mean, but yes, we're right. covering we, the same position. We're, we're, correct. I mean, that's all I'm saying. But, we yeah. just got our wording is specific. specific. I mean, that's okay. all I'm saying. So, it's also the, yes, if we're down 10 positions, we're looking to yeah. recover more. The needs have changed. The needs have changed. To justify right. that, because right. if we're yeah. complaining about losing 10 positions, but we're not losing, looking to replace 
all but one of them. I, I just have to be ready to I think it's simple uh, because the needs have changed because needs, of the pandemic. Yeah, I mean, that's simple. fair, but then we shouldn't really highlight the 10 that we've lost because- No, no, that no this is for us. Which is yeah. why in the presentation I did. Yeah. Right. Okay, cool. But also we may have had, like if we had the extra positions to work with, I know in the past we maybe have said, well, we're, we're moving away from this and we're doing this. So we've kind of sort of moved positions around with, you know, if somebody's retiring or they're left, and do, do we need this? We read assessed it. It's just this time around, we're working with that many less people. So that's why I, I think it's okay to do it that way. But I, I know what you mean by not. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, it does. And, and with the pandemic, I'm just extent, saying, right. yeah, yeah. yeah. I think one of the most important parts to all of this is that no matter what document we give them, mm -hmm. that we're in the discussion live. With yeah. They, they, it, the documents themselves don't, don't do, do anything. They don't, they don't do, anything. do the reality service. Right. right. Just, just service. And um, I think the preschool, adding to the preschool program, I think in the years to come, we're going to see a bigger and bigger and bigger push. Oh, yeah. yeah. For, I mean, I don't necessarily feel that should be us taking the entire burden on like we went from half day to full day kindergarten that was a necessity but i think they very desperately would love to have us take care of children from birth on but so you know that that pre-k program it's is coming. it's it's coming they it's coming. want the kids in there and and so but I we think need too, to baby steps toward that and exactly. i'm yeah. happy that, to see yeah. that you're yeah. adjusting and that's program. something that we're pretty good at yeah. uh, right. planning over time and making sure that we're not overly challenging any one operational budget yeah. and kindergarten is a great example of that and that was prior to me i just came in and, and with um, Ms. Olajars helped manage that right but there was no fiscal challenge to the town no. when we moved from half day uh kindergarten and tuitioned full day to just full day right right and that was due to the management of all of you who were here during those times and <laughs> Um, the you know superintendent and business managers before me. Yeah, and the way they yeah, looked at the bond. But it was it was yeah. right. Yeah. And it, yeah. You know, but it was managed well. There it was, was a vision of how to do it. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It, took, yeah. It, it was it was put out there that because my daughter was in that first class and it was put out there that the tuition there will be no tax increase. The tuition goes strictly to the bond. Right. And then when it goes, and we were all part of this discussion. Yeah, they were. When the bond was paid off. The tuition goes away right that's good and that's the way and they held we were able to hold to that yeah. for a long time um the other thing i would just slightly caution towards is directly correlating chapter 70 increases to increases in our budget times years we have very little increase in chapter 70 so to claim all of it this year that it should all we should get it all this year means in future years when it's low that we shouldn't that's all I'm saying. When yeah, no, it's a, it's a great point. I mean, you know, I think in order I don't think it holds water a lot of times when, it's, when you say there's increases or decreases yeah. in yeah. chapter seventy. No, that's a good and point. part of that chapter seventy does stay on the town side to pay for benefits that's of employees of the right. town too. So yeah. we can't really take all of it. That's all I'm saying. Just as in the, the presentation, yep. just throwing that out. Yeah. yeah. So in in this budget, really, what we're asking the town to do, and I thank you for pointing that out, is to meet us just a little bit above what their average would be over those seven years and, and stay at that 2%. Right. Give us the chapter 70 and increase their input by 2%. But that's the argument we're making though. We're directly yeah. correlating chapter 70 to our operating budget. So if we say that, well, you only have to contribute 2% more than chapter 70 in years that we get very little, then, then they should be able to apply that same logic and say, well, right. It's, we, you know, it's a great point. Yeah, half percent over chapter seventy, so we're only going to be half percent. But they have so. they've they've applied that logic in other we, years. We've where, applied that logic, but I don't know. No, they, they have they too. Have, if you look at it, have, if you, you look know, at we've gotten eight hundred and seventy-five thousand. They gave us 09 percent. Yeah. I think when times are good, they're good holistically. Maybe so. Okay. It's not directly correlated because it can't be because we also have years when we get very little, but we still sure. get something. Something. Sure. And and right now. From the state standpoint and the town standpoint, we're fiscally strong. Well, and that's my biggest worry. Everybody's drunk with cash right now. We're all going to go hog wild, and then the bottom will fall out in a year or two. And I'm I'm staying conservative. Yeah. Just looking for three. Well, but we are. We're not though, because we we looked at seven FTEs. That's a long term commitment to the town to to for benefits alone. I mean, you know, well, we're on. We're not looking at seven. We're looking at 
Five. And are we going to talk two. about this again? Two. Five and two. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yes. Okay, so, I'm in two. But I think when you think about because we don't pay those benefits now either. If we do pay those benefits. The town does? Yes. Yeah. Those Through benefits. The grant? No. No. They're already paying those benefits. So that's dangerous too, though, because if departments start adding positions not through the regular regular budget process, and then we have long term liability. Yeah, but how else do we use the grants, though, Greg? Huh? I mean, that, how else do we use the grants and grants? Well, it's fine. My, it's, you know? but my issue is that just rolling them over. That's all. Yeah. We're rolling over there by announcing that we're doing it. We're doing yeah. That. We're letting them Being know. transparent. Very transparent. Yeah, but we're adding seven FTEs. As long as we're on the same page, we're asking for seven, seven. more right. funded FTEs. Yeah. Yeah. We're on the same right. page. Yeah. Right. Think, and we've lost how many in the last couple of years? Ten. Okay. okay. We're not adding. So, we're think, covering. Recovering, recovering. FTEs. We're just recovering, recovering, but we're not reco we're recovering FTEs, but not the recovering FTEs. FTEs. Recovering FTEs, because, not, not the title. Again, it goes back to the needs of change. But can you call it a recovery if it's something different? Yeah. Like if I, yeah. I'm yes. recovering, yes. recovering yes. FTEs. My car got totaled and trashed, and I go out and buy another car. It doesn't mean yeah. I recovered it. You recovered the vehicle. No, you recovered the vehicle. You had one vehicle. No, I didn't. You recovered the vehicle. You recovered a vehicle. A vehicle. No, I didn't recover. That's you the, recovered the a vehicle. Recover is to get it back. You know, Greg, I look back. I look at, reacquire. I mean, like, for instance, I look at the, the okay. paraprofessionals, okay? Like, we have 90 paraprofessionals at, yeah. at this point. There was a point in time where we had over 100 well over professionals. 100. So we, you know, you look, you change, maybe having that counselor is able to take stress off of the teacher, we're able to eliminate a pair or two. You know what I'm saying? It's evolving. And so, yeah, we lost 10 different positions. We're asking for seven, some are some, some, some are not. But this is kind of a, they have to understand, this is just a tricky situation we've been in. It's, it's been unprecedented. And I know that we, we, but we're we not trying. seven positions. We, we can, can we agree to that? Well, we can no, drink. We're, we're <laughs> no. 3.9%. Okay. I'm going to keep my mouth closed. <laughs> it, could happen. it can happen. And I think to your point, like you're talking about a long term commitment on the behalf of the town, but it's a long term commitment on behalf of our children. Right. right. We have kids that we just heard the numbers. Like we have kids who need help. And clearly what we have right now is not helping them to the extent that they need it. Right. In addition to that, we have an ever diversifying population. We have almost a third, nearly a third of our student population is now yep. meeting the definition of low income. Correct. That's going to come with a host of yep. responsibilities that we need to take on as a district. So if we don't start now to address this through the recovery, the reissuance, the whatever we want to call it of positions, then we're going to be climbing an even steeper hill next year yeah. and the year after. And the cost to the town then won't even touch this because it's going to be doubled, tripled in terms of impact that we're going to need to make on kids. We've identified those numbers that you gave us a little while ago of needing services. How many more kids are out there that have not been identified? Right. Because we don't have the ability or capability to identify them at this point. I mean, but they're still wearing masks. I, I'm sitting around, I'm just sitting there thinking of the kids, the speech issues alone, I feel moving forward, um, not being able to articulate properly, not be able to just understand facial cues. And th I just, so it's like, I hope they understand that. Not that we're even looking for those types of positions right now, but I hope they see it. My other thought is, are we giving them that? what they want? Are we giving them enough information without overburdening them? Well, this is only start. Unnecessary. But is this, because um, I, I know sometimes that. they want a little more, but yeah, it's I think not it's, their it's position, worth having we want them some to be type happy. of cover sheet to explain the spreadsheet. Yeah, okay. absolutely. All right. You know, I just want to make sure that they feel comfortable what we've given them without burdening them with well, too much information. Correct me if I'm wrong. We don't even know when we're meeting again, right? We, there's no dates out there. No, but um, this would be a start to asking for when correct. the next meeting is. And I know that um, Mrs. Trulio has been in contact with Mr. Kane. So hopefully that will generate another meeting. Well, that's the goal. Well, that's the start. That's a lot of work. So thank so, you, Pam. <laughs> yeah. um, we need some sort of emotion. Yes. But I do think this should also be pending. Like we haven't seen data yet. And I I get that we want this and I understand that we're looking at those positions. We haven't seen any data, which I 100% understand 
they're in the in the midst of taking assessments right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I do think if we submit this, we also should say, like, somehow, like, pending our first round of data. Yeah. Well, I would not submit it then. I think if you're going to ask for different positions than we're asking for today, I wouldn't ask for them later. You don't want to change course. But if we've got to submit something we soon, we have to. We I don't know that the data is going to shift your needs. No. I think the math is still going to be significantly. Okay. We may see growth, um, but I, I mean, in terms of say social emotional data, um, we're going to see some upticks, but we're also going to see uh, disengagement. Okay. So I mean, I think. All right. So, I just like that is concerning to me because we have not seen any in person assessment data mm -hmm. and that can chart growth or chart what our reality actually is. Because when we took it at the onset of the academic year, it was their first time taking an in-person assessment this academic right. year. Yeah. And then we haven't had two assessments occur while they were in person. Right. This is the first time that we'll have that. They're working on it this week, right? They're yeah, finishing, they're finishing it. it. So that's my only is, uh, yeah. uh, well, I mean, if you, one has, but if we have to tweak one of the positions, then I think we can. Or, or me, and I mean, I think that's your, just a thought. That your, just your math is still, nothing is showing me right now that math is not still our okay. most right. dire right. area for yeah. elementary. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, just think you, I mean, you're going to want to make your um, interventions much more specific. So we're gaining that okay. with these positions. All right, then that works. Mm. But yeah, I think the data is going to be interesting. There are some positives. That's good. I mean, yes. <laughs> I mean we've been in school, so we should yeah. see yeah. some So there, you will see positives. But at the same time, like we also have to, that is also what we need to anchor ourselves to. Mm -hmm. Because this is our first real measure of what our students and our teachers are actually facing. Because this is the first sustained period of time that they've been in the classroom in almost two years. Right. Uh, and we're not we're not unique. I mean, yeah. I think that districts around us are experiencing these same things. I just remember as I said, I was just flabbergasted when a group of second graders had all they could do to hold a scissors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like a scissors. Who would think of that? But guess what? They missed it in kindergarten. They yeah. missed it in first grade. Right. Yeah. You know what I mean? I yeah. mean, something as stupid as cutting a just piece of paper. developing routine has I mean, taken longer yeah. than self-regulation. Yeah, yeah. Self-regulation is a big one. Like, oh. <sighs> And that's just for superintendents. <laughs> that was a goal. And, and there are districts out there that are taking all of the ESSER money and dumping it into personnel. Mm -hmm. And that's even more dangerous because right. you talk about cliffs. Yeah. Those are going to come quicker. I, I mean, I think working with all of you over the last few years and working with Mrs. Blair and our leadership team, we've always tried to stay conservative, but allow for growth right I mean, we're not you know and i know it seems high 3.9 percent but pre-pandemic across the commonwealth 3.9 percent is pretty average it is not any long matter it is but across for a for a school district school that, districts are not across the state of. yeah how can it be the two it's, proposition two and a half it, School budgets at least half the, the town budget. If you school, were school budgets, if you look, you, you look across, percent they're, the they're getting four or five percent. They are. They overriding. They must override. No, they're not overriding. Um, they're just getting local contributions. If, if the town budget is half school, half town, and four percent goes to the school, stabilization then only one percent goes to the town. Right, but stabilization and stabilization. Not every year. Cash. I'm just saying. Not every year, yeah. but on an average, average, because I've looked at the same data. And it's really? it school, yeah, yeah. Local contribution. We're, 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 why are we so worried about our tax rate all the time? Because we're that. We were that That's was crazy. drilled into our heads back when the appropriations committee yeah. was still here. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. And that mentality hasn't really changed. No, mm -hmm. it's not a bad thing because it makes you think about what you're spending, how you're spending it, and not being foolish. I mean, that's there's it. there's <laughs> there's a race to twenty five dollars. It's either Newton or the town right next door. Oh, yeah. And the the state has already said we are not giving you. The ability to go above that prop two and a half. The only avenue is still through overrides. Right. It's dangerous. Hmm. Or you start cutting services. Hmm. I understand the fiscal conservatism here, but there is a time when, to everybody's point, the town looks pretty good. So let's not go nilly willy here, but let's try and try and grow a little bit. Oh. 
complain. All right, so we need to make those adjustments to Greg's point mm -hmm. around the seven. So that he's um but I think we need a motion to submit this. Yes, but I'm just saying like yeah, yeah so we, the, the, the change would yeah. include yeah. making sure that the FTAs are that's separate. Right. Okay. That's or, separate. properly allocated. It's a different role. Yeah. Um and I'm asking, like I'm not feeling partial either way. Do we feel like there is a need to submit a narrative alongside of this right now? Because any a cover sheet, not a narrative. I there's have, a difference. Um, I, I can't speak for the committee, but we've always provided some type of overview yeah. as to what the spreadsheet was presenting. Um, this isn't the whole budget, it's just the beginning part of it. So well, I mean, this is this is the budget. Right. But it's it, not it starts the discussion. You're you're not voting it as a final budget, but right. you're giving preliminary information so that they can start to have their discussions because we're at the moment, I think we're the only town department that has not provided the town finance director and accountant um, a budget so that uh, they can look, have an idea of where the overall budget would be for the town manager's mm -hmm. budget. All right, so I'll give us, I'll take a stab at this. I move to, to authorize the superintendent to submit the FY23 school department preliminary budget request with the edits that were presented this evening. I'll second that. Is that good? I I just think I I still am unclear as to what the cover sheet is going to include because we have a lot of information here. We have five pages of information that I don't think needs to all be submitted. So I don't think oh, no, I would, I no. the cover sheet was just going to be an overview of what this is asking, okay. along, along with the um, chapter seventy increase, that the strong fiscal uh, situation at the state level. Okay. All right. So motion made by Bill, mm -hmm. second by yeah. Beth. Yep. Any further discussion? All, right. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. And that motion carries by zero. And we look forward to the next step in that conversation alongside of the town. And I think the key is the conversation. Yes. That we can it is. Keep the conversation going because we've had good discussion so far and we want to keep it. A be positive and ongoing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. The next we have school printing. Oh, no, there's one more sheet. Two more sheets. Nathan? Yes. Okay. Um, so the second part of it is how you would like us to reflect um, your stipends um, if you would like us to ask for an increase or um, submit it as it currently is um, in terms of the total which is broken out on that second page or this page second page, second page. Um, with the chair vice chair and then the members um, stipends. I believe last year there was a bit of a, an increase, or was it the year prior? Year prior, we didn't get any last year. They okay. yeah. referred so it to a committee 20... last year that never happened. Okay. Yeah. You know, like sometimes I feel like it, you feel like you're being, um, I don't know, greedy by asking for stipend, but there is a bit of work that's involved there's a good deal and, of work you know and i and i feel that um years ago there was if you wanted it you could have done the insurance through it that type of thing they took that away and i i feel that you know we're i think we have a bunch of half the work and i just feel that asking for a little bit more you know for for those that are in this position in the future i i don't think there's a wrong thing to do at all i don't know it barely pays for the gas. <laughs> At least it used to barely pay for the gas. <laughs> what did we do last year? We submitted and it was rejected. Yeah. No, but what did we submit? 20, 25%. 25%. So if we did 25% you know. again, 
it would be an increase of $525 for the chair, bring that, that person to $26.25, and each member would get $400 and bring that to $2,000. I don't think that's outlandish. It's not, and it's, and it's, I think, less than, less than half of what the town council gets. Yeah. Oh. I'm out of way. I, I, yeah. I mean, I we can do point. nothing. There's a lot of, of work that gets involved, but the 25% is still not going to, I don't know, entice no. individuals to want to do this work for anything other than wanting to do right well, I know. by their community. I know of course, I mean, that's just my thought, but. I've never been in it for the money, quite honestly. No. <laughs> it is what it is. So, just... well, do we want to throw them 25% just for the heck of it and see if they say? I mean, the worst thing that happens is if they say no. Sure. 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 I think so. Okay. okay. Let me do it. All right. Thank I you. move that um, we request a 25 in, 25% increase for the elected salaries for the school committee members. Uh, starting from fiscal year 23. Okay, motion made by Beth. Second. Second by Antonella. Any further discussion? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries aye. Thank you. And sorry, now last is the new business of school committee meeting dates for 2022, 2023. Uh, so you have an outline of the dates, uh, only one of which uh, mm -hmm. this year, which is uh, very nice, is offset by a holiday where we have to meet on a Tuesday. So I know that um, reduces the conflicts for Mr. Mackey, and we'd like <laughs> to do that. Um, we would have to set a reorg date in July. I believe July 1st is a Friday this year. Um, I think we've met in the morning to reorg last few years. If anybody's in, I know that that's bordering a, a holiday weekend, although a lot of us are, are marching, if not all of us uh, on that Monday anyway. Um, yeah, I know. I may. I'm, I'm praying. I'm not in Maybe town. Maybe DJ. And, and <laughs> I am praying. Amped up truck. I am. <laughs> that was fun. That was fun. I think that was a good time last year. I'm trying. It really worked. We got town bets over your. I'm hoping I am. Yeah. When are you back? Probably going to try to be back on. Is that even the right date? When's July fourth? Is that the Monday? Monday. 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 Yeah. Monday. yeah. Uh, probably wouldn't be back until the fifth. You know, so if that's okay, because I wouldn't, well, the first is a Friday anyways. I'm hoping I'm away, far away. So can we do the fifth for that week after? I'm okay if you guys want to meet without me, if that's okay, you just put me where you want me. Oh, that's <laughs> and I, dangerous. Yeah, and I get what I get <laughs> and I'm happy to help anyway. Yeah, I don't know that I'll be here on the fifth, but okay. I think once we start getting in, to yeah. deeper into July. So if July 1st works to... for everybody, I'm okay with that. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. Okay. So July 1st in the morning? Yeah. Okay. And if I'm here, I'll be sad. <laughs> <laughs> zoom in. We'll be happy. We'll have you can zoom in. For you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll zoom okay. in. And then um, after that, we generally have a, sort of an organizational, let's get ready for the school year meeting on the 22nd. Um, okay. If we need to, we can always add a meeting in there, mm -hmm. and then we're off and running uh, with our two meetings a month. Okay, all right, that's good. Oh, I'm sorry. What time would you like to meet on the morning of July 1st? Yeah. Nine o'clock, mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> you just have the uh, some of the committee yeah. meeting dates Did that 17 times? as listed below, including a reorg date. Of July 1 at 9 a.m. Motion made by Greg. I'll second it. Oh, second by Antonella. Any further discussion? Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. And that motion carries five to zero. Thank you, Mr. Mackey, for Thank you very much. filming this evening. And Nick, who hopefully does well on his exam tomorrow. Yes. And that one's his motion. So moved. So moved. Motion made by Bill. Second. Second by Beth. Any further discussion? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. And that motion carries by. So thank you, everybody, and have a good night.